and welcome to Verona. Located in northern Italy, in the Veneto region, and almost halfway in between the larger cities of Venice and Milan, is Verona, a beautiful and romantic city off the Adige River. Once settled by the Romans, even earning itself the nickname of Piccola Roma, which means Little Rome, the city has changed hands countless times, from Romans, Venetians, and Austrians to Napoleon. The cultural hands are showcased in much of Verona's architecture, and that's why in November of 2000, the city was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Verona was made famous by Shakespeare's star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet, and is also known for its Roman amphitheater, the Arena, which is now used for opera and concerts. But I have to say, this city is totally underrated. So we have just arrived in Verona, and I am so excited to be here. If you are a big Shakespeare fan like I am, and a fan of Romeo and Juliet, this is the city that you want to come to. Verona was just a day trip for us because we were staying in Lake Garda, which is also in the Veneto region. So it was under an hour and the most stunning drive because Verona is surrounded by gorgeous vineyards, making for a relaxing and romantic drive. Our first task in Verona was to pick up the Verona card which we had purchased the 24-hour card online for 20 euro a person and were supposed to be able to pick up at any of the museums. But we were given vague details. The card can be purchased at multiple sites, including in person at the Verona Tourist Office. We wanted to be able to skip the lines, which is why I purchased a ticket online but you do need to have a hard copy of the ticket, which actually sent us on a bit of a wild goose chase upon arrival. The card will get you into all of the main attractions, as well as give you ATV free bus travel in Verona. It also gives you the opportunity of scheduling a time to visit Juliet's house and balcony, which was a top priority for me. We found great parking right off of the Adige River near Ponte Pietra, which was a great location. So our first stop was super close at the Musee Archeologico and the Altitro Romano, where I thought we could pick up our Verona cards and check off that visit off of our list. But the museum and the theater were open strange hours, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. So we would have to make that one of our last stops and now need to figure out where our next opportunity was of getting our Verona cards. So I'm now crossing the Ponte Pietra. Um, it is one of Verona's most famous bridges here. The bridge was actually built by the Romans, but it didn't make it through World War II. It was partially destroyed, though they did try to rebuild it with its original materials. But this bridge will take you across into Verona and you'll go through one of Verona's famous gates. city has been ruled by so many different um, groups from the Romans to the Venetians to the Austrians oh, I hear some kids screaming <laughs> um, but I think that's what makes this city so interesting and so beautiful because you definitely see the remnants of all these different cultures just in the buildings um, and it really is just a really beautiful city
stop was at the Basilica di San Zeno Maggiore, which was a part of the Verona card, but wasn't a quote-unquote museum. But I thought we should give it a try anyway. The Basilica is partly famous for its Romanesque architecture, and the other part is based upon the tradition that its crypt was the place of marriage of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. I knew I wasn't dressed appropriately for the church because my shoulders were exposed. I was dressed more for the heat than the basilica, and in Italy, they are quite strict about their dress code. So after a quick look, we headed towards the Castel Vecchio Museum, where I knew we could finally get our card. tickets and made our first official stop with the tickets checking out the Middle Age Castle Vecchio Museum. The museum is open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and closed on Mondays. And in here, you'll find the history of the castle through a collection of medieval artifacts and factual displays. It's located right up the banks of the River Adige. The Castle Vecchio was built as a residence and fortress in the 14th century. It, as well as the city, was ruled by the Della Scala family, and under the rule of the family, the city experienced great prosperity, becoming rich and powerful, and being surrounded by new walls. You'll find the Della Scala era is preserved in numerous monuments around Verona and even all throughout Lake Gerda. At the time of its establishment, Castel Vecchio was the most important and most powerful military construction in the area. Extended out from the fort is the Castle Vecchio Bridge, also known as Ponte Scaligero, which was the longest bridge of its kind in the world at the time when it was built, which we were planning to come back to since we had an appointment soon at Juliet's house. So this castle was built by the famous Della Scala family, or Scaligeri, another name for them, family. Um, the castle was actually built to keep people out. That was the whole point of it. The family was wealthy. Um, they owned Verona, they owned all the lands around, even including Lake Garda, and they were always afraid that they were going to be overthrown. Although built for practical purpose and military use, Castle Vecchio, Fort, and Bridge like most of Verona's old historic buildings from this era, were made from red brick, which helped them stand out among the city's beautiful natural landscape. On the way out, I really needed to stop to use the bathroom, but apparently the museum was still using the medieval techniques of no toilet and just peeing into a hole. So I decided to wait until I could find some plumbing of the year 2023, because I just couldn't even attempt it. Peeing into a hole was not for me. From there, we were off to our appointment to visit Juliet's house and her balcony, in which I had to book an appointment time on the website when I purchased our Verona Pass. The courtyard was absolutely packed. Juliet's house is open Tuesday through Sunday and open 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Right away, I found Juliet's mailbox, which actually inspired the Hollywood movie Letters to Juliet, in 2010 and is also what inspired me to want to visit. It all began in the 1950s when a custodian began responding to letters and notes the tourists left behind. When he retired, the tradition was continued by a succession of volunteers called the Juliet Club, also known as the Secretaries of Juliet. Their office is the balcony opposite Juliet's balcony and there are a team of writers who work all day long answering letters to Juliet asking her advice on matters of the heart. Juliet's house is a 14th century residence that is said to be the home of Juliet Capulet from Shakespeare's play Romeo and Juliet. The house is now a museum with Renaissance era costumes and the actual bed used in Franco Zeffirelli's 1968 film adaption of the story. 
So I'm in the house of Juliet and I'm about to go out onto the famous balcony. Welcome to Juliet's Balcony. What most people don't realize is that the story was born from the pen of Luigi de Porta, a nobleman from Vicenza and was published as a short story in 1531. Though the Veronese setting is probably inspired by Dante's comedy Purgatory, published in the mid 1300s, where it speaks of the medieval feuding families of the Montecchi and Capoletti fighting one another over political struggles of the 13th century. In 1553, two versions were written by the famous novelist Matteo Bandello. It then reached England, where in 1596, it was staged by William Shakespeare with the title of The Most Excellent and Lamentable Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, then making the story of Romeo and Juliet universally famous. The house was once inhibited by the Capello family, a name similar to the Italian versions Capoletti and dates back to the 13th century, though the famous balcony wasn't added until the 20th century. On the bronze statue of Juliet, you are supposed to partake in the popular ritual of rubbing her right breast for luck and love. Almost everything about this house is fiction, but the emotions that drop people to it are real. You'll find graffiti scribbles and notes from visitors asking for guidance and love, many attached with chewing gum. But since the Verona City Council set new regulations to prevent the practice, since the gum was damaging the walls, instead, they've provided removable panels for anyone who wishes to partake in the custom. It seems that human emotion might be a little too much reality for this fantasy house. From there, we grab some pizza at Pizzeria La Costa in Bra. We're so hungry, I didn't even film it. <laughs> After lunch, we're making our way back over to Ponte Scaligero to finally have a look. And on the way, we pass the Grand Guardia Palace, built from 1609 to 1853, which is now used for events and exhibits, and Portoni della Bra, the two arches of the town gate with a rather impressive clock in the middle that encloses the Piazza Bra to the south. of heights, he decided to sit this one out while I climbed all over the bridge. I loved it. All I could think in my mind was this would absolutely be such a no-no in America. Aside from the fact that we don't have anything that old, climbing on anything in America is always considered a liability. So this was so fun.
right next to Castle Vecchio, you will see the Roman Arch Arco de Gavi, built to pay tribute to the Gavi family back in their day. And then a little further down the street, we visited the Porta Borsari, which is a first century Roman arched limestone gate that served as the main entrance to the city. that, we headed back to Piazza Bra, the largest square in Verona, and where we had had lunch earlier. The piazza is lined with restaurants and cafes, as well as its home to the arena, which was our next stop to see. statue of Vittorio Emanuel II. This is the same statue that you'll find in Milan. He is the one who is responsible for unifying Italy. So very famous. It always blows my mind that these Roman arenas, that they still use them today. I mean, these stones are so old um, and it, it just, it, it's crazy to me, maybe because I live in a country that's not that old, but to see items of such history um, still being used today is just, it's, it's crazy to me. <laughs> The arena is a gorgeous Roman amphitheater that was built in the first century AD, around the end of the Augustus Empire. It is the third largest surviving Roman amphitheater in the world and now used for opera and concerts. Thanks to its elliptical shape, it offers some of the world's best acoustics, which is why the biggest names in the music industry, as well as opera, have hosted the most unforgettable live performances in it over the past few decades. So I wish tickets were still available for Aida, but that's the opera that's going on um, in the evenings here in Verona at the moment. So these are set pieces from Aida. The yellow building behind is the Palazzo Barbieri, also known as Palazzo del Gran Guardia Nuova, but now known today as the city's town hall. This palace was built during the Austrian occupation. Too much. 
much I like how we just met and I'm not even slightly afraid to be opening up I like that we've been sitting here hands moving around the clock and I still can't get enough No, I can't get enough But we could Here we stroll through the city shopping district to get to our next piazza, the Piazza del Urbe. To the left of you, you'll find a group of tall, narrow, huddled buildings. This is what remains of the old Jewish ghetto of Verona, established at the end of the 1400s. Today, a lively marketplace, but once the original site of the Roman Forum. Although it was once used as a central location to sell produce and homemade goods, most of the stalls at the piazza now offer tourist souvenirs instead. I definitely looked around the stalls, but did find them to be a bit expensive. The piazza is surrounded by multiple important buildings. From the Torre de Lamberti, a year 1172, 84 meter high bell tower in which you can see some modern art and panoramic views of the city for 7 euro. To the Mazzanti houses, dating back to the Renaissance and known for their outer building frescoes. middle of the stalls you come to what looks like it was used for torture, but it is the La Bolina, a very old portico with a podium in which the measurements were made for the various types of goods on sale in the market. On a column is engraved the units of linear measurement and carved on a step are the shapes of a brick and a tile. The ring at the end of the chain was used to measure the diameters of the bundles. The masterpiece of the piazza is its fountain, a gorgeous historic monument that dates back to 1368 when it was built by Consignorio della Scala with a Roman statue called Madonna Verona, dating back to 380 AD. At the end of the square stands a large stone column St. Mark's Venetian Lion, reminding locals of Venice's conquest of their city in 1405 to 1797. The following monument of the woman commemorates one of the first civilian bombings in history, which took place on the 14th of November 1915 during World War I when Austrian planes dropped bombs on Piazza Urbe during market hours, causing 29 deaths and numerous injuries. Piazza del Urbe, we walk through the Arco della Costa, an arch with a whale rib hanging from it, with a legend that says it will fall down if the first innocent or truthful person walks under the archway. We strolled into Piazza del Signore, which is also known as Piazza Dante, a small square surrounded by monumental buildings. In the center is a statue of Dante and perched atop buildings around the square are statues of more famous signore. So this piazza feels like I just walked into Florence. Um, it feels so much like Piazza della Signoria in Florence, which is where we stayed when we were there, especially this back building. And of course in this piazza, they have 
Dante here, um, who is said to be the father of um, Italia, um, just like Shakespeare was the father of the English, um, in, or the English language. Um, they say um, Dante is the father of the Italian language um, because he lived here shortly um, after he uh, fled from Florence um, or was abolished from Florence. Dante, the great poet and the father of the Italian language, spent seven years of his life in Verona during his lengthy exile from Florence. The piazza was a leading cultural center and the preferred place for many people who had been sent into exile during their power struggles between the different ruling dynasties. The square was once the seat of the city's public institutions and you'll see the 14th century Palazzo della Prefettura, formerly the Palazzo del Governo, which was a residence of the Scaligeri family and where Dante stayed as a guest. The great building with the Grand Arch is the Palazzo Domus Nova, the Palace of Judges, the former seat of the city Podesta and the city offices, now a hotel and restaurant with rooms from the 14th century. What's really amazing about this piazza is that every single entrance to it has a gate to it. We walk through one of the gates to the courtyard outside the church of Santa Maria Antica to visit the tombs of the Scaligeri family, one of the most influential families in the history of Verona. The Scaligeris ruled the city throughout the 13th and 14th centuries. As long as you are by my side, all along the way. As long as you in my eyes, I can see it through. As long as you are next to me, every step of the way. This elaborate structure behind me, um, these are actually the tombs of the Della Scala family. Um, so, you know, talk about, you know, a family with money. This is probably as elaborate as it comes. <laughs> with the Verona card, we were able to get in to see the group of five Gothic funeral monuments that each tomb is dedicated to for a different lord of Verona. As I said, these tombs of the Della Scala family, um, you know, these were not ordinary people, obviously, um, by the look of these ornate tombs that were done for them. Um, they're really pretty amazing, <laughs> pretty exquisite.
back to the Museo Archeologico and the Al Teatro Romano, about 20 minutes before closing. <music> What made the visit so amazing was that I had no idea that a rehearsal would be going on. Our timing was impeccable. We walked in to see this old Roman theater and um, sure enough, they're using the theater for a performance, which again, so amazing. Another form of Roman ruins being used uh, for performance. This one, the theater, the other one, the arena. Um, just incredible and so awesome to see a rehearsal going on right now. So I know that this theater is actually a recent find. Um, I know at one point it was completely covered and if it wasn't for the church above um, and then putting money into excavation, I believe they're the ones who put the money or someone purchased the land um, right below the church and decided to excavate it themselves once they found a bit of the ruins um, and found this incredible Roman theater here. Um, really amazing, like I said, now here there's a live orchestra uh, rehearsal going on. The theater was built in the late 1st century BC into a hill overlooking the Adige River. And what makes the story of these particular ruins so amazing is that it was lost for centuries. Over time, the theater was abandoned and gradually destroyed by earthquakes, floods, and the natural passing of time. At the start of the Renaissance, the entire Roman city had turned to ruin. A church and convent had been constructed on top of what was still left. The first archeological excavation started in 1757, but the ancient structure wasn't rediscovered until 1834 by Andrea Manga, a wealthy Veronese businessman who had bought the entire area and ordered more excavations. By 1904, the city had acquired the area and ordered more diggings. chocolate and strawberry and so good and I have to show you this place because the flavors are amazing next we took the funicular up to San Pietro Hill we're about to take the funicular up to San Pietro Hill um, for a round-trip ticket up and down it cost three euro each San Pietro Hill is accessible by foot or by modern day funicular, but after our full day, the funicular was the only option for us. There's a cafe to enjoy an aperitivo, and you'll find some stunning views of Verona. We got a love that's worth the wait. We came back down on the funicular and now it was time for us to grab our car and head back to Lake Garda. I'm never gonna let you go. What an amazing and beautiful day trip Verona was and just so much to see. 
Now you should understand why I think that Verona is a totally underrated city in Italy. Make sure to stay tuned because in our next Italy episode, we'll show you where we're seeing in Lake Gerda and the amazing towns around the lake. See you next time.